So just in case you guys didn't know, Scott already retired once. Then he's gonna retire again. And I asked him, is this time for real? Are you really gonna retire? Scott, I guess this is it, right? You're definitely gonna retire this time? <laughs> Yes, I'm definitely going to retire, and if I don't, my wife, I'll probably have to go through a divorce. So, <laughs> Alex, so uh, I'm definitely retiring at the end of this year. We're turning over CEO to Rich Daly before we close, so Rich will still be CEO mm -hmm. um, January the 1st. And then I'll be uh, still a Pioneer Director yep. till we close, and then joining um, the Exxon board. We'll have two board seats um, as part of the deal. So, Darren, you know, when I think about two companies getting together, this was like the rumored one for a while. What was the biggest sticking point, Darren, to coming to this kind of deal? Was it the price? Was it the timing? What was it for you? So we've always said, if we're gonna do a deal like this, we've gotta find a, a proposition where the sum is greater than each of the parts or the, the, the total is greater than the sum of each of the parts. And so it's really been focused around how do we drive unique value and value that we can then bring to Pioneer and its employees and its its assets to make the, that combination bigger than the sum of the parts. And frankly, the work we've done over the last several years to uh, develop uh, leading edge technologies, the, the work we've done around unique development approaches, when you take the advances that we've made mm -hmm. and then uh, couple that with the pioneer of employees experience and uh, and that, that uh, acreage and then the tier one acreage leads to a, a fantastic uh, opportunity set to, to produce, recover more resources, yeah. do it cheaper, and to do it lowering emissions. So, so Darren, to that point, um, and maybe both can speak on this, um, Pioneer Natural Resources in the first two quarters, uh, there were pr productivity issues. Uh, many analysts say that the productivity issues have been resolved and that they troughed in the second quarter, uh, et cetera. But I'm wondering, Darren, what you can bring to basically use new juicy technology to get more new juicy oil out of the rock that's been there. There's a lot that we can bring to that. And in fact, that's been the effort that we've had underway for five years now. And some of that we've implemented today, we have some unique approaches to uh, what we call cube development, where we are drilling mm -hmm. a number of wells to, to tap into the total resource and make sure that we're maximizing recoveries. We're drilling the longest laterals in, in, the, in the Permian over four miles. Uh, we've got unique uh, completion technology. So there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that we've been working on that are in the field today, producing better results. And then we've got a lot of technologies that are in the pipeline or just now being deployed that we haven't seen the benefits of, but we anticipate good things. And so we can bring all that to the top tier resources that uh, Pioneer has, and I think uh, improve the recovery beyond what either company could do in isolation. Yeah, four mile lateral, that's a whole different bag of chips there. Um, hey, Scott, from your perspective, you've been doing this for 40 years. People are talking about how this deal is going to kick off a shale 3.0. Bigger companies, bigger deals, bigger, more fierce laterals. What do you think, Scott? And like, who do you think is left that's going to have to merge after this? Yes, uh, at, at the Pioneer board level, we've talked over the last two years. We think long term, you have to become a diversified company. Uh, and the question is, do we do it ourselves or do we become part of a company like Exxon Mobil? I really think Exxon has the best stock of all the diversified companies around the world, uh, the best growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think after this transaction that companies, shell companies cannot survive on their own long term. They're going to have to merge up, yeah. consolidate and be part of a diversified company is my, is my general opinion. And this should happen over the next five years. So is it going to be like private guys getting together or is it going to have to be like what you did and really sort of reach for an Exxon that has such a huge reach all across the globe, Scott? Yeah, there's only, as you know, there's only two large diversified uh, in the um, uh, majors in the U.S. that's left. You got ConocoPhillips diversified. You mm -hmm. got Oxy that's diversified. So I think shell companies are going to have to combine and either try to do it on their own or they're going to have to merge into um, a one of the diversified companies. That's my general opinion of the three or four so, that I mentioned. Um, so, Darren, to that point, does this merger change any investment decisions that you're going to make for stuff out of shale, like in Guyana, for example, or Brazil, Mo uh, Mozambique? Um, is it going to change you looking for acquisitions out of the U.S.? 
No, I think if you look at what we're doing here, it's very aligned with our strategy. We've organized ourselves to prosecute um, competitively advantaged uh, investments along different resource types. We have an unconventional business. Scott's business is a pure play unconventional business, so it slots right into our existing unconventional business. We've had the same focus on productivity and, and resource recovery and capital and cost efficiency, so I think there's a natural sink here. Mm -hmm. And if you look at our unconventional business and Scott's business, this they're of comparable sizes, so it's it's a merger of equals. Scott's business is basically funding itself and generating additional cash, so it's not going to need any help from the rest of our businesses. I'd expect the rest of our businesses to continue pursuing their uh, investment pro uh, portfolio and looking for additional opportunities in that space, more advantaged investments to make in those businesses. So that, that feels like CEO speak for sure. We're up for mergers elsewhere, too. <laughs> Well, I would tell you it's the organic opportunity set that we have. And I, th I tell you, the business that's growing the fastest for us is a low-carbon solutions business. Mm -hmm. And and they surprise people, but this transaction actually benefits our low-carbon solutions businesses. It, it makes available more uh, uh, low-cost, lower-carbon natural gas that we can then feed into our Gulf Coast assets, mm -hmm. feed into our carbon hydrogen and ammonia plants and so it helps on the transition side we're also working with scott's team we expect to pull their net zero uh, uh pledge from 2050 to 2035 so we're going to advance getting scott's permian organization and, and mm -hmm. uh, operations down to net zero by 2035 which is 15 years better as we continue to advance ours to 2030. Mm -hmm. so scott to that point do you guys think you're going to get any um, regulatory pushback? Because I see it playing out two ways. One is like it's $60 billion for oil. Administration may not like that. But on the other hand, we need more oil uh, and not rely on, say, the Saudis or Venezuela or Iran. Scott, what do you think the conversation is going to be like in D.C.? No, we, we, we don't have downstream. The combination is less than 15 percent of the Permian Basin. Uh, let me let Darren comment. His team has done a lot of work on this. And so let me let shift to Darren, let him comment on the regulatory issues. Darren, what do you I think? think I think on the regulatory issues, as Scott said, if you look at the size of our business in the context of the global gas and oil markets, we're very, very small. Even in the context of the Permian, as Scott said, we're less than 15 percent production. From, from an environmental standpoint and concerns about the growth of oil, the world is going to continue to need oil and gas for some time to come. What society should be focused on are companies that can most effectively produce the oil and gas that society still needs. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. We're building a company with better capabilities to deliver those products with much lower carbon carbon emissions intensity. So it's it's a win for the environment because as long as it's needed, you want the most responsible operators producing it. Uh, with this combination, we will be the most responsible operators with the lowest carbon intensity and, and with really good plans mm -hmm. to take us to net zero. Between um, 2030 and 2035. Uh, I, I know I got to guys let you go because I know you have to go talk to your employees. But one more question, and it's the broader oil price. Uh, we are obviously seeing uh, violence erupt with the Israel Hamas war. Headlines are breaking all the time. Uh, volatility has picked up in oil. So I want to ask you both um, what do you think the new range is for oil based on all the geopolitical risks that you're seeing? Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I think I interviewed with you three months ago, and I said we'll be between 80 and 100, and that's where we've been. Uh, so the big question is, does Iran and uh, Israel, uh, does Iran get involved in the war? They, it's proven that already that uh, they knew about it. Uh, they said yes to Hamas invading um, Israel. So the question is, Netanyahu's got to make a tough decision. If Iran gets involved, uh, it's going to get bigger and bigger, and it'll significantly affect all prices. Darren, what do you, you think? I'd add, I think if you look at the macro, uh, supply is tight uh, versus demand, and you've seen, uh, and that's been a function of really coming out of the pandemic and the uh, the general underinvestment across the whole of the the industry. And so you've got limited uh, spare capacity today, and what you're really seeing is prices move as demand moves because there's not a lot of short-term capacity can be brought into the marketplace. And so really going to be a function of demand, and any loss in supply that's out there today is going to have a big impact. And I think as long as that market stays tight. We're going to see more volatility and higher prices. 